It's hot out, and a man walks beside the Nile. He left just before the longest day of the year. He feels the sun's rays beat onto his uncovered shoulders. The wind blows against his belted linen skirt. Now he isn't strolling along aimlessly. For days, he's been walking heel to toe with extreme focus. He counts every time the balls of his feet hit the earth and lift off again. He cannot mess up. He has to get this count right because this is his job. He's been hired to count as many steps it takes to go from Alexandria, a city in northern Egypt, to Syene, a city in the south. His boss is Eratosthenes, the chief librarian of Alexandria. Eratosthenes is a mathematician and a poet, and he is trying to answer a question. Is the world flat? or round? It's been a popular question in his day and age, and Eratosthenes is an astute observer. Every day at high noon, he sees all of the buildings in Alexandria cast a shadow. But in his readings from his library, he stumbled upon a passage about how the buildings in the city of Syene cast no shadows at high noon. This could be a clue. If the earth is flat, then the sun's rays will hit the earth the same way, no matter where you are on the planet. But if it's round, then the shadows cast at noon will be different depending on where they sit on the curvature of the Earth. All Eratosthenes needs is the distance between these two Egyptian cities, and he might be able to figure out the answer. So he hires a man to take on the journey and waits with anticipation until he gets back. This man for hire walks along the Nile, the ribbon of water that cuts through the dusty sand dunes. As he walks and walks and walks, he passes trains of camels, reeds below in the river, ibises fly high above him. His leather shoes hit the sand. He stops under an occasional palm tree to cool off. These trees are sparsely placed along the riverbank and are the only objects that cast shadows around him other than himself. I don't know how he kept track. If he had a papyrus roll in his pocket, tallying each step he takes, or if he magically is able to keep it all in his head. But after weeks, maybe a month, the man traces and retraces the Nile from south to north, all the way down, and then all the way back up again. During this journey, the Nile River is his lone star in a country made of sand. Then one day, he returns with the count. When he arrives back in Alexandria, more fit and tan and well-traveled, he walks up the steps of the Alexandria Library. He wipes the dust from Syene off his clothes. He sees Eratosthenes hunched over one of the 700,000 scrolls in this grand library. He walks up to his boss and delivers the count. Eratosthenes' face lights up. He rushes to find a blank scroll and sketches out a few math problems. After doing a quick proportion equation, 
I've got it. Eratosthenes has just discovered the circumference of the world. He grabs the shoulders of the hired man in joy. This weary traveler has just made a huge contribution to how we understand the world. The Earth is round. It has no edges, and Eratosthenes proves this with nothing more than a shadow, a math problem, and a pair of sore feet. But unlike his intrepid traveler for hire, the man who discovers that the world is a sphere will never experience the full roundness of his discovery. But in 1889, a woman who will travel the total circumference of the globe has set sail for Egypt. I'm Adrian Bain, and this is Strangers Abroad, a race around the world, based on the true adventure of Nellie Bly. Day 11. November 25th. Nellie is as weary as that Egyptian traveler. In the early hours of November 25th, Nellie is up on deck admiring the lapis water around her. She did get on the correct boat to Egypt, but she does not get the rest she so desperately needs. As she stares out at the clouds, she reflects on the last 12 hours. After she sprinted through the streets of Brindisi to her boat, her sleep was constantly disrupted on the ship. First, she forgot to close her porthole above her bed. So at daybreak, when sailors were mopping the deck above her cabin window, buckets of sudsy water streamed through the window, down the walls, and onto her and her bed. By the time she cooled off, dried off, and tried to go back to sleep, the stewards on the ship knocked on the door to clean the rooms and kicked her out of bed. So begrudgingly, she slipped into a lighter silk bodice and went up on deck. So now, she leans over the railing, eyes heavy as she stares out at the boat create white, foamy strips in the midnight blue Mediterranean. She feels weights behind her eyes. All of this travel has been much rougher on her body than she would have guessed. She eventually comes out of her daydream and takes a look around at her fellow passengers, lazing about in their summer garments. Standing here, amongst strange people on strange waters, I thought, how sweet life is. As the sun rises, so does her mood. She feels a rush of excitement zip through her body. She looks out at the small Greek islands passing them by in the distance. She closes her eyes and feels the sun warm her cheeks and forehead. <sighs> she takes it all in. She looks to her right and looks at the men playing cricket. And then a hand catches her eye. Nellie turns and sees that her English cabin companion is sitting on a deck chair and waves her over. Nellie's cabin mate is surrounded by a small group of other young British women. So Nellie coyly walks over to them and all of the women welcome her. They make room in their little circle and start asking her dozens of questions. And Nellie checks a prejudice. She thought that the English female passengers would be a little more aloof. But instead, 
They're completely fascinated with her. Why, being an American, she's a bit of an oddity. And a solo female traveler, forget about it. These women chatter all afternoon about Nellie's journey and their own adventures. And Nellie appreciates being with other women who are interested in getting to know each other instead of staying cooped up in their cabins or being confined to their male companions. They talk from sun up to sun down. Day 12, November 26th. Even though these women ask her every question under the sun, Nellie doesn't seem to tell them all about the specifics of her trip, like how it's a race and everything. So, because Nellie doesn't get in front of her narrative, it doesn't take long for a rumor about her to germinate. Only after about a few days, one of Nellie's new friends comes up to her and tells her that gossip is spreading. Word is going around that you're an eccentric American heiress, traveling about with nothing more than a hairbrush and a bank book. I judged that some of the attention I was receiving was due to the story of my, quote, wealth. When the rumor hits the men's ears, several of them rear their heads in Nellie's direction. The first man who approached her introduces himself as the Honorable Windham Curtin, a small young man with a bushy red mustache. You are the kind of girl that I like. And so I'm the second son of an earl, and my brother got all the money in the title. So I am on the lookout for a wife who could give me a stipend of a thousand pounds a year. Which by today's standards is roughly $84,000. Nellie is flabbergasted, but not rendered mute. He flirtatiously asked me for my hand. And when he asked, what would you do with me if I said yes? I said, I would put you to work. Somehow, her response sours his mood. (sighs) On to marriage proposal number two. There was another young man on board who was quite a unique character and much more interesting to me. I have been traveling the world nonstop since I was nine years old. And all I've ever wanted is to marry a woman who wants to travel as much as I do. But I expect that I could never find a woman who could travel with fewer trunks than me. Nellie notices he's very exquisitely dressed and changes his clothes at least three times a day. So she asks, How many trunks do you have? Nineteen. I no longer wondered at his fears of getting a wife who could not travel without trunks. When she gets her third marriage proposal, Nellie's had enough. It's time to go undercover again. Nellie looks at her third suitor with wide eyes as he fumbles through his marriage proposal to her. She coughs. (coughs) Puts her hand on her brow. She takes him by the hand. I (coughs) have a confession to make. I am not a wealthy heiress. Far from it. In reality, I'm a beggar from New York City. You see, my health is poor, and some charities have scrounged up some money to send me around the world before I pass. The nuns back home hoped that I would find some benefit from the sea air. (coughs) Her suitor straightens his lapels and wishes her good health. 
The line of suitors ended after that. Now that Nellie isn't being stopped by every man on the ship, she goes to enjoy the music played by the second class passengers alone. Better than all to me, it was to sit in a dark corner on the deck above, where the sailors had their food and listened to the sounds of tom toms and weird musical chantings. That always accompanied their every meal. The sailors on the ship are Lascars, and Lascars are what Westerners call Asian men, usually from Southeast Asia or India. They work on European ships as soldiers or sailors. In reality, they're typically indentured servants. Their work is hard. And most men have to rely on a translator between them and their captain. They live in British ports between sails and often fall into poverty when there are too many men vying for jobs. On the ship, they live in cramped spaces, as Nellie shares a clean, comfortable cabin with one other English girl. Lascars are the invisible hands whose work helps get Nelly and all travelers around the globe safely, quickly, and smoothly. Day thirteen, November twenty seventh. On the afternoon of the twenty seventh, Nelly sees land again. Only this time, it is golden and green. Egypt. The land opens up to them. One of Pharaoh's mummies and pyramids. The steamship anchors at Port Said, a northern coastal city that rests on the mouth of the Suez Canal like a beauty mark. Before 1859, it was a rural piece of land, home to a few fishermen and seagulls. Then the creation of the Suez Canal cracked it open and built it up. Now, this sleepy fisherman town is one of the most visited ports on the planet. From the deck, Nelly sees palm trees shading newly developed white buildings. A hazy mountain outline towers over aquamarine waters. In the harbor, boats crowd the shore, ready for trade or to make a quick pit stop before they head through the Suez Canal. A warm, ancient breeze blows over her. She's about to step on the land where humans evolved from apes and where civilizations were born. By the time they anchor, everyone on the Victoria hasn't seen land for a few days. Although Port Said isn't much to look at, it could have been a ghost town, and people wouldn't have cared. Everyone on the ship welcomes a change of scenery. As coal is being shoveled into the ship, Nelly decides to explore this desert city. As all of the passengers head towards the gangplank, Nellie notices that all of the British men and women bring canes and umbrellas with them. When Nellie inquires, some men mention that it's to keep the beggars off. Excuse me, Nellie is appalled when she sees several of her British passengers pick up these canes and umbrellas. I didn't bring any of this. Because I think that a stick beats more ugliness into a person than it ever beats out. The ship is surrounded with a fleet of small boats. These local boatmen are all competing with each other and shout at passengers on Nellie's ship to come into their boats. As Nellie waits for her turn, she watches as some of the steamboat sailors and passengers. Beat the local boatmen off with long poles, so passengers are able to get onto the boats carefully. 
This is appalling. Nellie's eyes are wide as she watches in horror as some of the local boatmen grab at passengers that have entered others' boats, trying to pull more customers into their boats. But now it's Nellie's turn. She puts out her left hand and slips it into the hand of a local boatman. She gingerly steps off the gangplank. She squeezes his hand tightly and feels the cracks in his hands as he steadies her. Then she spins and sits down with no hassle. Once everyone is settled, they head towards the shore. Then, halfway on their journey, the boat stops and the local boatmen demand payment now because apparently the English are known for not paying once they've reached shore. Nellie hands over her coins and notices that she is caught in these strange social patterns of the globe. This is normal, and this cycle happens every week like clockwork. The boat finally reaches the shore and she steps off into the sand, sinking ankle deep until they reach the promenade. Nellie looks at the rim of the city, shaded in dark green sycamore and mulberry trees. Floppy palm trees pepper the edge of the beach. As Nellie and her fellow passengers make their way from the harbor to the city proper, Peddlers swarm them, selling Turkish delights and cigarettes. Others just hold out their hands and scream back sheesh, asking for charity. Before Nellie can clock the abject poverty, she's surrounded by local boys who offer people rides on their donkeys. Nellie turns around to see the harbor, and there's a large statue of Ferdinand de Lesseps, elevated above on the edge of the water, arms and head forward in a position of pride and glory. He is the Frenchman who convinced the Egyptian government to open the Suez Canal, which took the lives of 10,000 locals while making it. As they step into the city, Nellie doesn't want to go shopping. Her grip sack needs to be kept light especially if she has to do any more mad dashes like in Italy. So instead, she takes a gamble on her time. Nellie and a small group of her fellow passengers go to an Egyptian casino house. As Nellie makes her way through the streets, she passes more than just Egyptians. Some men wore fezes, others wore planter's hats or pith helmets. She passes markets with small mountains of fruit and spices, perfuming the streets with scents of cinnamon, honey, and salt water. She passes by bungalows, billiard parlors, smoke shops, dance halls. Some signs are written in English. Others are in French or Arabic. Packs of dogs lie in the streets, covered in flies and waiting for scraps of food. Men sit outside at cafe tables, drinking cups of steaming black coffee or tea out of tiny curved glasses. As this group walks through the dusty, hot streets, Nellie looks up. She notices that women in burqas with their faces painted, are hanging over balconies. Their eyes are outlined in coal and their lips are painted with carmine, redder than poppies. Women, who used to be Egyptian queens, had been severely demoted. At the height of the Egyptian empire, women were equal to men, no matter her marital status. Ancient women were able to be merchants, run their own businesses, or become high priestesses. They were intricately involved in the social, economic, political, and spiritual spheres, and their independence allowed them to divorce their husbands 
own their own property and live alone. But when the Egyptian dynasties fell, it took women's rights down with them. As Nellie goes about the streets of Port Said, she mostly sees women in the home. At least it's mildly permissible in Nellie's world for her to be taking this kind of a trip. Nellie hears a small female chorus of Egyptian singers luring them into the casino. When one of her companions opens the doors, traces of tobacco smoke and opium seep out into the streets. There are Egyptian singers performing in one corner. Nellie surveys the space. This wooden, windowless room is packed. Nellie settles up at the Wheel of Fortune, which she spends most of her time playing. Gosh, everything is so cheap here, and it's just such a thrill. I want to bet higher and higher and higher. Nellie is fine to be a silly little tourist, throwing her money away for the afternoon. After losing to the house, the crew exits the casino and slowly makes their way back to the boat. As they pass by more shops, the only thing Nellie does buy is a sun hat, which is customary in the East. This purchase is justified. The hat will protect her from the sun as she ventures deeper into the tropics and closer to the equator. Nellie places her new sun helmet on her head, tied by a muslin scarf under her chin, to block out the blinding white sun. As Nellie and her entourage walk back to the ship, she passes by streets lined with beggars. And the beggars are so used to outsiders that they barely attract any attention. Her heart is heavy with how many there are lying on the street, arms outstretched, trying to appeal to passerbys. They had a hardening effect on me. Well, I used to be poor, but at least my mother and I never had to beg. She feels embarrassed that she just threw her money away on some gambling game when these people are begging for change on the street. I, I just wish this wasn't happening. I don't want them to look at me. They can't possibly think that I'm rich. I'm not a millionaire like Pulitzer. Nellie places her palm on a stone wall, trying to feel some cold. She witnesses the dichotomy of travel, all of the beauty and all of the sadness. I'm just passing by to get on with this race. Just close your eyes. It'll be easier to get through. Even after all of her undercover reporting of corruption and exploitation in America, this level of extreme poverty and depression of the locals is sobering. Something she hadn't considered is whether or not she could handle what the world will show her. She makes her way back to the harbor and Nellie feels weighed down, even though she's only bought a light hat. As the promenade opens up, Nellie looks out at a train of camels. She passes by women in black burkas with naked babies strapped to their hips. As they get closer to shore, Nellie notices a group of men wrestling with something in the water. It's a crocodile. A dozen men surround it, writhing in the water, fastening its mouth with rope and strong knots. Nellie's never seen one alive, let alone so close and being wrangled by a bunch of men. Egypt is a completely different world than her Appalachia upbringing. The biggest beasts she had to deal with were maybe the occasional black bear. 
But here, crocodiles, camels, cypress trees. This is other people's normal. Nellie is breathlessly fascinated. Something shifts inside of her. The world feels much larger than she originally thought and much more complicated. It starts to look a little different than what she expected. Darkness descends. Nellie gets back on the little ferry and gives her coins to the local sailor. And when she gets back onto the ship, she feels it make a sharp right turn and head into the Suez Canal. Day 14, November 28th. At the first rosy blush of dawn, Nellie wakes up early on the 28th. She wants a look at the sun hitting this world-changing canal. This line of water connects two worlds and stretches 120 miles long. She hustles up to the deck, gets the sleep out of her eyes, squints, shakes her head, and upon one glance, wishes she stayed in bed. She saw nothing more than an enormous ditch enclosed on either side with high sandbags and just endless desert around it. The water was brown and the ship felt like it was hardly moving. She feels every heat particle stick to her skin. Now, the slow pace of the ship is deliberate. Since the Suez Canal was opened, there's an influx of boats passing through. So they have to limit how many ships are going through at a time. And if they go too fast, it will make the sandbanks erode. So no ship is allowed to go more than six knots an hour. This 120-mile journey will take a full day to get through. A sloth doing a doggy paddle, wearing a gravity blanket, could have gone faster than this boat. This gave the passengers a little too much time to gripe about the situation. Our passengers are mostly English people and not the jolliest lot in the world. To pass the time, she chats up a man who seems to know everything about the Suez Canal. He's been traveling all of his life. Suez Canal. It took 10 years to create. Took the lives of 100,000 workers. 88 geographical miles in length. <sighs> width is 325 feet. Nellie doesn't appreciate his lack of storytelling. So she has nothing to do but sit back in her steamer chair and look at the monotonous landscape. Nellie can only enjoy the scenery when they're going at her pace. Frankly, this is taking forever. How much longer will we have to go this slow? How can I make up for this lost time? Nellie slaps her arm. The thick air and semi-still waters make this an ideal landscape for mosquitoes. She spends the time counting how many she's killed. Her mind wanders. Less than a week ago, she was rushing through barren, wintry France. And now she's miles away in the Middle East, surrounded by white sand, palm trees, and traveling at the speed of a dying fish. What a whiplash. Continuing the journey through the canal, we saw little of interest. Passengers just make the same small talk and repeat stories that they've already told each other. For miles and hours, they pass other ships that are moving so slowly. People on passing boats wave at Nellie's ship and shout over. They ask where Nellie's boat came from and where it's heading. 
and people on Nellie's boat wave and shout back the same questions before they're pulled away in opposite directions. Nellie fans herself all day from the stifling heat. Even though it doesn't feel like it, time does pass. And finally, when the sun drops down below the horizon, they drop anchor at the Bay of Suez. The passengers can't get off the ship, but that's fine because plenty of locals come to them. A number of small sailboats with white sails glide up to the steamship. They remind Nellie of moths flocking to a light. They're filled with salesmen peddling fruits or photographs or shells. But these passengers don't need more stuff. They need entertainment. And in this crew of traveling salesmen, there are a few magicians and one juggler who takes his craft seriously. This juggler wears a sash and a turban, and deep in his heavy pockets are two lizards and one small rabbit. Everyone gathers around him. Once the juggler feels like he has the crowd's attention, he scans through the passengers, and out of all of them, he points to Nellie to be his assistant. Nellie gladly steps forward. She stands next to him in front of the small semicircle of passengers gathered around. The juggler raises his hand and shows a handkerchief. He shakes it out, flips it around, waves it through the air to demonstrate that it's nothing more but a simple piece of fabric. The juggler then takes out a small brass bangle and does the same thing, tosses it in the air, puts it on his wrist, pretends to put the handkerchief through the bangle. The juggler then turns to Nellie and she smiles at him. He places the handkerchief in my hand, telling me to hold it tightly. I did so, feeling the presence of the bangle very plainly. He blew on it, and jerking the handkerchief loose from my grasp, shook it to much amazement of the crowd. The bangle was gone. The juggler bows. Everything is going perfectly. People hand him coins from their pockets. Now he knows he has the audience on his side. The juggler reaches to grab the props for his second act. He bends down into his bag and can't find them. He panics. His eyes are wide with fear that his props might have hopped or slithered away until he notices wrestling in the audience. The animals didn't escape. Some of the passengers stole them. He demands they give him back his pets. One young man takes the rabbit from his pocket and meekly returns it to the juggler. He sighs in relief and pats his bunny. Then another lizard is found in a corner, but the other is missing. It's time for the locals to leave the ship, and the juggler offloads with two-thirds of his animals. Once the ship sets sail, fellow passengers come up to Nellie and ask how the trick was done. It was an old, very uninteresting trick as she breaks down the mechanics of the act. One of the men who was listening to this explanation became very indignant and wanted to know if I knew positively how this trick had been done, why had I not exposed the man? I merely explained I wanted to see the juggler get his money, much to the disgust of the Englishman. 
Nelly wants some space from this quote-unquote gentleman. So as the day comes to a close, Nelly goes up on deck one last time to watch the sun exit the day. Now in the darkness, Nelly up on deck points out groups on the shore. Small tents are sprinkled along the shore. Men and women wrap in layers of thin cloth. Hamels curl up on the ground like cats as they all surround a red, fiery flame in the black darkness. Nelly takes a mental photograph of this timeless image. Then she heads off to bed and quietly celebrates being out of the Suez. Day 15, November 29th. Now out of the canal, they're able to chart along much faster. The ship parts the Red Sea as Nelly heads further south. The eastern side of Egypt passes by her right, and to her left is the western edge of the waning Ottoman Empire. During her peaceful, lazy afternoons on the Red Sea, the most traveling she does is from her easy chair to the side of the deck. She looks over at the rich blue beneath her. Red is such a strange name for the sea. Nellie will not see the seasonal blooms of red algae that change the color of the water's surface. And beneath her is one of the world's richest coral reefs. Over 300 species of coral line the entire coastline, with thousands of fish, sharks, dolphins, turtles, and manta rays all swimming about. Nelly breathes in the thick Arabian air. She is out of Egypt and is skirting along the southern edge of the Middle East. Nelly loves being on the move as the world passes her by. Although she's enjoying being on the sea, she wants nothing to slow her down. As she enjoys being lazy, the world newspaper is in a frenzy. On November 29th, two weeks and a day into the race, the World Sunday paper makes an announcement. After hemming and hawing about how to get the race more attention, the editors finally had a bright idea. When readers open their Sunday papers, a small coupon is placed inside of it. On it, readers can guess and submit when Nellie Bly will come home. Whosoever guess is closest to the actual winning time will win a free trip to Europe. It's a guessing game within a race. Do not fail to order your Sunday World at once to fill out a blank therein with a guess. Free trip to Europe. Every reader's head snaps in attention. Reading closer, people will have to guess the closest day, hour, minute, and second that both of Nellie Bly's feet step onto the Jersey City train platform. Anyone can participate and submit as many tickets as they would like. The coupons are printed in the Sunday paper, the more expensive one, naturally. The coupon itself is beautiful. It's a Victorian illustration of Nellie wrapping a measuring tape around the equator of the globe, sitting on a bed of clouds. Under her, the ticket lays out all of the rules, the names of the guesser, their address and date of the guess, 
and at the bottom of the ticket reads in bold, Guess early and often. It was like a Willy Wonka ticket, and people aggressively bought newspapers like those candy bars. Between now and the last Sunday before Nellie comes home, readers can buy as many papers as they want. And the winner can travel any time in 1890 to visit Paris, London, and possibly Rome. Nellie's little blue dot is now in the minds of thousands of people around the nation. Anyone who has access to the world's newspaper now has an incentive to pay attention to the race around the world. The world newspaper often reminds its readers that their intrepid female traveler left on November 14th at 9.40 and 30 seconds in the morning. People who want to guess scramble to get maps of the world, steamship itineraries, and train timetables. The week that the guessing game is announced, people calculate that Nellie has to be somewhere in the Mediterranean or the Suez Canal. They start making their own maps of how far and long it's taken Nellie to get from New York to Egypt. Everyone could only guess on a hope and a prayer. And on November 29th, the day the announcement is made, the coupons begin trickling in, similar to how a few snowflakes fall before a massive nor'easter hits. The editors at The World receive their first hundred tickets rather quickly by Monday morning, then their first thousand, and then two. And it didn't slow down from there. By Tuesday morning, the offices are littered with these tiny five-inch coupons. Some people send in 20 at a time and inform the editors that they will be doing so every week until the race is over. At the time, the mail is delivered four times a day to the New York world. And with each delivery, the pile grows higher and higher and higher, turning that sprinkling of coupons into a glacier. Guesses arrive faster than editors can count them. And Pulitzer sits back. He finally found the jackpot that he was looking for. Day 19, December 2nd. But all of this chatter will not hit Nellie's ears. She is blissfully ignorant and worlds away from the excitement. She has no idea about the guessing game, people's thoughts about her, or that there's even another woman in the race. Nellie's just happy that she's keeping to her schedule. Unaware that thousands of people have her little blue dot in their mind's eye. Nellie spends four days on the Red Sea. As they exit the Red Sea and hit the entrance of the Indian Ocean, the ship needs to refuel one last time. So they stop on the peninsula of Aden. It's another British port that they got by bargaining with the Ottomans. As Nellie's ship moves closer to the city, she stares out on deck at the high brown mountains to her left. This city is built in the crater of a dead volcano. Everything here seems to have a biblical bend. Local legend believes that Aden is as old as humanity itself. Some believe that Cain and Abel are buried somewhere around here. And for centuries, Aden has always been a resting place for sailors hustling through the Indian Ocean from Europe, around Africa, and over to Asia for everything they wanted to trade. Then once the British took it over, now it is a free trading port 
and the trading community exploded. Liquor, salt, weapons, opium, coffee, tea come in and out of the city. And once the steamship entered the game, it became a necessary coaling station to restock on fuel to get from one side of Asia to the other. Nellie's ship anchors near the land that sees 344 days of sun a year. And Nellie has made up for the time she lost in the Suez. When she reaches Aden, Nellie has traveled just shy of 7,000 miles. Almost a third of her journey is complete. They anchor shortly after 11 a.m., and Nellie states that like clockwork, their boat is surrounded by a number of smaller boats, bringing peddlers selling wonderful items from the east. The captain had warned the passengers that they should not go ashore to Aden because of the intense heat. So most of the women stayed on board. But I bet you can guess what Nellie's decision is. Me and a few other reckless ones. Well, we decided to brave the heat. We wanted to see what Aden had to offer. A local sailor rides them on to shore. No canes this time. And Nellie admires how ordinary people dress very ornately. Nellie chats up the boatman who rows them to shore. He wears strings of gold, black, and silver beads all over his body. Around his waist is a multicolored sash. His arms and ankles are weighed down by heavy bracelets, and each finger and toe holds one to two rings. He speaks in English, and Nellie and him get to chat about his life. He has three wives and 11 children, and by the grace of the power of his faith, he hopes to increase that number. The boatman tells her about the sandstorms that sweep over Aden, sometimes so intensely that it blocks out the whole sky. Nellie can relate. She's seen the pollution back in Pittsburgh. Nellie looks around at the men swimming in the water. Some of them have rubbed lime in their hair to bleach it. They bob along in the water singing local songs. As they glide towards the entrance, the wind whips around a few strands of hair not tucked under her sun hat. Nellie stares up at the pelicans and seagulls flying over her head in the distance. The city is flanked by massive old mountains, jagged and gray, barren and wrinkled like the local elders she'll walk by. The water here is slate blue and ominous. The shore is dotted with little green fishermen's boats. The land that was built on prophecy, and Nellie can feel it. She then notices a panopticon looking down from a hill. This majestic white building is perched on a bare mountain, created for English sailors who are stationed in this barren land. At 1,700 feet above sea level, the English flag waves in the wind, casting shadows as Nellie considers the colonialism of the British Empire. As I traveled on and realized more than ever before how the English have stolen almost all, if not all, of the desirable seaports. They pull up onto shore, and Nellie and her intrepid passenger friends hire a carriage and head down a wide, smooth road that takes them along the beach. Eventually, they arrive in the white city. The land is dry and ashy, and the heat beats down on them. Few trees offer shade. Nellie looks out at the bay and watches water carriers fill up their goatskins. As other locals, 
cut stone and load them onto camels' backs. They pass through the entrance of the city, walking by the British sentinels pacing to and fro under a large stone double gate. Nellie walks through these densely packed markets. She sees fishermen chop heads and the ground around them shimmers with fish scales. She stops at burlap sacks of coffee beans and skims a few of them off the top. Their oil absorbs into her fingertips. The smell of roasting coffee mingles with the scent of flatbreads baking in stone ovens, roasted lamb, and spicy lentils. Some shops are run by Parsis, descendants of Zoroastrianism. Men drink tea on small stoops in front of shops, all layered in patterned robes. Women wrap themselves in thin silks. And were as well adorned as Nellie's sailor friend. Women are covered in hoops, rings, bracelets, and chains. Any limb that could hold a hoop did. Before the arrival of Islam, like Egypt, Yemenese women had a strong voice in society. There was the mythical queen of Sheba and her glorious abundance. Then there was the real-life Queen Arba, the only female monarch to rule in the Muslim world. But since then, the tides had changed, and when Nellie is exploring Aden, the society is deeply patriarchal, and women have been stripped of all of their rights. Men can marry up to four wives, and women do not always have the free will to agree to a marriage. Every union has to be approved by male guardians. Mothers lose rights to visit her children if she chooses to leave her husband. Nellie watches as some figureless bodies covered head to toe in black clothing pass her by. Only the skin around their eyes is visible. Nellie feels the sun beat down on her cheeks and the back of her neck. Although their attire is starkly different, they both do what they can with the rules that are set by men. The sun dips closer to the horizon, and now her short time in Aden comes to a close. Nellie and her crew turn around with no relief from the heat. They load back up onto the ship. Nellie leans over the side of the deck, looking out at this ancient arid land. And she notices down below, some Somali boys are diving and swimming around the boat, singing songs together. As they wave goodbye at the boat, Nellie waves back at them. Then she hears them scream from below, beckoning the passengers to jump into the water, what she wouldn't give to have some relief from the heat. She watches as some of her fellow passengers throw sparkling gold coins into the murky waters. The local boys dive in the moment the silver hits the water. They disappear like flying fish, holding their breath for minutes. Then finally, one of them bobs up and has the silver stuck in his teeth, all while swimming in shark-infested waters. But the locals know how to slather their bodies in a grease that offends the sharks and leaves the locals alone. They swim with such an ease as if they have gills and fins of their own. Now that they are loaded up with coal, they are finally ready to set sail for Colombo Salon. And Nelly will officially arrive in Asia. During this trip, Nelly has only been focusing on how big the world is. But now she must consider how old it is too, and how some pockets harbor so much pain. 
Nellie considers the other side of travel. For so long, she's only been thinking about the physical aspects of racing around the world. But does she have the emotional strength to handle all that the world will throw at her? It will also show its raw sides to Nellie too. But Nellie has plenty of time to think about it and to unwind during the next seven days at sea as she crosses the Indian Ocean to Colombo Salon. And little does she know that when she lands in Colombo, her competitor will also be taking her first step onto Japanese soil. A Race Around the World was written, produced, researched, narrated, scripted, edited, edited again, soundscape scored, re-narrated, and voiced by me, Adrian Bain. Sam Dingman was our editorial consultant and emotional support. Windham Curtin was played by Fabian Martinez Sanchez. Eratosthenes, Marriage Proposal Man Number 2, and New York World Editor was played by Sam Digman. Suez Canal Man was played by Jonathan Tenace. Father Time was played by Jake Digman. Resources include 80 Days by Matthew Goodman, Around the World in 72 Days and Other Writings by Nellie Bly, and for more resources, go to our website, Please go to Apple Podcasts to rate, review, and subscribe to A Race Around the World. If you leave a review, I will read it at the end of the credits, like History Lesson plus Solo Travel Inspo equals great. Doug On It Fan 1 gives it 5 stars. Learning about a couple 19th century icons who traveled the world has me scheming for my next solo adventure. I'd love to help plan it with you. And if you're interested in all of our bonus content, anecdotes, and historical facts that didn't make it into the show, head over to our TikTok at Strangers Abroad Podcast. If you'd like to send us an email, please send over a lovely message to strangersabroadpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and come back next week for another leg in the adventure of Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland. Safe travels to everyone out there.